Hey, here is another episode, right? It's not just another episode. This is a long episode because I know it is because I'm going to be talking to John Lovitz. Yes, John Lovitz. Exactly. So uh, welcome to Bob Saget's Here For You, but it's really going to be John Lovitz. I don't think I'm going to be able to get a word in. It could last four hours. This is going to be like Lovitz of Arabia. It's not going to end. Um, a few things I have to let you know, which is to rate, review, and, uh, you know, you can do that. You can leave a comment. You can also call that phone number up in the menu. And when I call people sometimes, uh, leave a message. I just want to thank you guys for listening because uh, I've been getting such nice feedback and the podcast is is getting out there quite well. And it's because of friends like this person I've known for a long time. And he's going to attack me because that's what he does. And he is a he's a good man. Um and he's been in quarantine, so I think it's going to be the longest conversation I've ever had with anyone. Uh, please welcome to the podcast my friend John Lovitz. Hello. Hello. Happy New Year, John. Thank you. You know, uh, Bob, this uh, little person was in a bar and he was very upset, crying. And they go, what's wrong, buddy? And he goes, I, I can't make money. They, they uh, closed the circus. Right. He goes, well, you know, the Guinness Book of World Records is across the street. And uh, he goes, if you have anything on you that's small, you know, you get a record. He goes, well, my hands and my feet aren't, they're kind of normal, but my penis is, it's a small, I, I, he goes, it's real smaller than all of my friends. Did they have a record for that? And he says, yes, you get like 1500 bucks. You should try. All right. So he runs across the street and he comes back 15 minutes later. He goes, well, did you get the $1,500 for the world's smallest penis? And he says, no, who the hell is Bob Saget? <laughs> so that could be any name, but exactly. I fit, I fit Pass the bill. It on. I don't want to brag Bob, but, uh, I met a girl on Facebook during this coronavirus and she wanted to have sex with me. Right. And she goes, oh, wait, how can we have sex? We have to have six feet between us. And I said, don't worry, I'll fold my dick in half. Wow, that's almost like a joke I'd heard years ago. But, but you I, I, No, I'll just take out enough to win. And was then, the, uh, oh, yeah, right, that's right. And the Milton then, Burrow. Yes, and then I met another girl and I uh, lived in the mountains on Catalina Island. Did you really, for real? Yeah, and well, on Facebook, and we were talking. She said, "I want to, you know, I love you. I want to make love." And I said, "Well, I go. I don't know how you live on Catalina Island in the mountains. I'm in Los Angeles, thirty miles away. Can you at least walk down to your beach and meet me halfway?" That's hilarious. And you'd she have to take did. And I'm pretty sure on the way to her house, I got a two dolphin and a whale pregnant. <laughs> By the way, so you, it was a blue whale, and now it's a sperm whale. Because you you'd filled it up in the blowhole. You don't I have know. to you explain. I'm trying to explain. Some kids don't get it. You Hi, know, Bob they, Saget, Joe Killer. Let me. Two yeah. Jews walk into a bar. They buy it because Jews tend to buy things. Uh, first time I heard that was Richard Belzer. And I know that it was a joke that's probably been around since the beginning of time. I never way. heard him say it. And if he did say it, he got oh, it. Oh, I did. I did hear him say it. Well, I didn't. So there. Well, well, okay. So it's up to. Oh, I heard your whole act before. <laughs> your last show. So you're stealing from yourself. <laughs> what are you drinking? What's that little thing? Are you drinking paint? Oh, it's a five-hour energy boost. That's how you do it. That's how you have this amazing surge of that's energy. How it, that's what's keeping me awake to speak to you. <laughs> My God, I've known you. Uh, Are you in your half. office? Is that like yeah. your awards behind you? No, it's just some stuff. That's a Rodney Dangerfield thing I got from the UCLA Brain. I was Center. looking at it. I got the same award. That, probably after you. From yeah, John. you probably you probably did because Rodney loved you. In fact, look at this. I have a picture. I was honored to get it. People, you were on it today? No, I was honored to get it. Oh, okay. You have great sound. Anyway, um, this is 
I'm going to buy you a microphone for your next birthday. When do you turn 75? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Here's a picture. And it's... Uh, oh, yeah. That was at your scleroderma event that you invited. That's the first time you've said that disease properly. But it's, it's uh, Tim Allen and Robin Williams and then you and then Rodney and then, and then me. You. No one thinks it's me though, because I looked so much better. No, I, but, I, uh, yeah, I love that picture. That I felt honored to be in there. That's why I'm smiling so big. <laughs> and and uh, that was a great night. And uh, I had, I had really didn't. I just started doing stand up, and you asked me to do it, and I said okay. And then I go, how am I going to follow Robin and Tim? And the answer, of course, is with ease. I think it's because you went on before them. <laughs> no, I went on after them. Are you the kidding problem, me? Yeah. Well, how'd that happen? They didn't, they, they really didn't. They, of course, they're fantastic comics, but they didn't, uh, they didn't really prepare anything. They just got up and talked. You know, they weren't really doing their act. Right. Most people don't at the benefit because they just riff because they want to, uh, yeah, they want to save their act or you're not, you're not paying them. So they go, well, I'm not going to do my act. Fuck him. <laughs> no, I don't think so, it's, well, so, but, and I had like an act that I did. So it was more planned. I was with a friend that said Rodney was laughing. He was laughing very hard at all my jokes. Afterward, Rodney was like, John, good jokes, which was a huge compliment because I just started. I go, thank you, coming from you, you know. And uh, I, I know you were very close to him. He was a great guy. And I remember the joke he told, too. I think, I think it was the last time he ever actually performed in public, but he did it from his table. I remember yeah. he stood up and he goes, they go, Rodney, you introduced him, and everyone went nuts. And he goes, thank you, thank you. He goes, oh, I just finished. He goes, uh, Thank you. I just finished the book. I'm thinking of reading another one. <laughs> <laughs> and I miss you know, him. Funny, th people go, what's the hardest thing in comedy? I go, those jokes, one-liners. I think, I think they're the hardest to write because you have one, it, you know, jokes is set up in a punchline and, and you have, you, it's like, you got to come up with it quick. I mean, like right away. And it, it's, it's hard to do. But they're also some of the funniest jokes. But those are the hardest ones to write, I think. When I started, that's all I did because Rodney was one of my main influences. And then Richard I would watch, and then I would learn to do longer stories, but they and weren't about me. And African-American. I wish, actually. And he influenced you. I mean, if you could be anything, are you happy you're Jewish? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes. you know. I mean, if I could be anything, it would be less handsome. It's a burden. I'm not Mission kidding. accomplished. You know what? You are good looking and you have a, can I tell you something? Honestly, you've always had a cool hairline. Always. And uh, you've sustained it. You're hilarious. Well, I've always admired your freckles. And I think if there was a way to connect <laughs> Especially them, the ones on my back. Thoughts, what would the message be? And John, think, get off my back. Yes. Something. Would you have, did you ever have sexual feelings toward me? Just answer quickly. Don't think. Yes, I do now. <laughs> you know, I did this movie in Miami Joe called uh, Killing Hasselhoff. And yep. uh, are you I have your IMDb here. It's exhausting, John. Yeah. It's exhausting how many things you've done. Yeah. The, 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 anyway, I thought one of the funniest jokes in the movie was that. Uh, uh, well, anyway, the movie's about a, a day. Uh, there's a betting pool, celebrity death pool. Who's going to die first? And Ken Jeong, uh, he's like, he needs the money because he has a nightclub that burned down and a girl left him. So he gets the idea, I'm going to kill. He he bets on David Hasselhoff dying. So he goes, I'm going to kill David and get 500,000 bucks. And David's playing himself in the movie and I'm his agent. Anyway, they hire a hitman who's uh, who has also gay. And so there's a scene where the hitman and the guy was, I forget his name, is really funny. And he goes, no, I'm a writer, but I've seen him other stuff. And he, so he's in David's bedroom and he goes, and he goes, God, you're so gorgeous. I don't know whether to fuck you first or kill you. And then David goes, oh, couldn't you just kill me first? Yeah. <laughs> I actually had a dream when I was on a now college say that's tour. That's homophobic. No, I, it is, it is, uh, Back in the day, we, we did homophobic humor, which today is, I don't think, as acceptable. 
Um, Which leads us, of course, into all this, the um, 20 minutes of my act about you. That's what I want to lead to. But th- just to complete your thought, I was on a college tour with that Mitzi Shore had sent me on, and I was in a college in Raleigh, North Carolina. What year was and it? I, the 79. And 1979, and I was with so Jeff DeHart. 20, yeah, and, I, right. That's when I graduated college. So I was like 21. You were 21 or two. Or yeah, I was 22. And, and so I had a dream, these two guys, I had a dream, these two guys we met, they were big mountain men. I dreamt that they came in and said, first, we're going to rape you and then we're going to kill you. And I looked up at them and said, you wouldn't mind reversing that order, would you? So that's the short version of what you just said. It's Isn't like that, much it, better. It, every joke I bring up, you go, oh, I heard that joke. Well, I'm older than you. Well, I, it's so funny you say that because... I remember uh, my parents brought me to Vegas in the 60s. Oh, to- really? Because your parents brought me to Vegas. To see Shaggy <laughs> Green. And oh Shaggy said, she said uh, look at those two guys. I don't know if they're going to fuck me or rape me. Maybe they could uh, kill me and rape me. Maybe they could kill me first. That was in 65. Is that true? hmm So it all goes back to five jokes that Groucho probably. What about you? Did you, did you hear that joke before that? Well, I dreamt it, so I didn't ever say it on stage. So it was just oh, a nightmare. You never said it on stage. Oh. I might have, but I don't remember because uh, my um, 20s are a blur. I was pretty miserable in my 20s. It's funny. I remember um, reading a, a Carl Sandburg wrote, a uh, great author, uh, uh, books about Abraham yeah. Lincoln, the president. And then one of the chapters about how funny Lincoln was, and he would tell jokes like, uh, uh, two Jews walk into a bar, they buy it. And then Lincoln would say, um, I had a dream that somebody named Bob Saget's going to steal my material. <laughs> That's a, He was a prophet. He was prophetic. Yeah. He, they said two Jews walk into a bar to Lincoln, and he said, you wouldn't mind reversing that order, would you? Right. Because he was so ahead of the curve. He combined all jokes. So I have to ask you questions. I have to ask you something because I've, I've been actually, we've never sat down and talked about this and we've been around each other a long time. I mean, I would go on vacations and I'd go with uh, the, the, to Hawaii and there was one time and we had a mutual friends that were there as well and uh, the Greys and, and different comedians would come. Ed Begley Jr. was there. Gary Shanling was there. At, to- at a certain time in our You'd lives. You'd go every year, right? I did with my children and my ex-wife. She wasn't my ex-wife then. That would have been awkward. But um, but then my daughter, who was just here, my oldest daughter, Aubrey, said, I'll never forget when there was a phone call in our room, and it was you, John, and you said, hello, is your father there? And she said, no, he's not here. Tell him I'm here. And I'm going to spend every moment with him. <laughs> and John, I think it happened. I think here's a picture of your ass. This is a picture that I took of you that I don't think I've ever shown you. That's your ass. I was following you. And then well, here's another. Yeah, Ma- Manalani, and I believe that, um, yeah, my shirt looks wet. I must have come from the pool. You were always at the pool. You're tanning. How have you been through quarantine with tanning? Have you been able to get out in the sun? Well, I exercise a lot, Bob. You know, I play tennis a lot, and I play. Uh... You you obviously look, uh, look, look behind me. I'm looking. You've got a dog and a cat. You look like Doctor Doolittle. <laughs> are, are all animals going to surround you in a second? Are you? Do you live in an arboretum? What's going on? How many animals? You used to have three dogs, right? <laughs> What's going on? Is this cat going to shit on your head? People are going to want to see this. This everywhere with the litter box. <laughs> That's a pretty cat, by the way. And the it's, dog's it's adorable. Fred, Fred Dwyer. When's the bird fly into frame? Fred Perry Dwyer. <laughs> <laughs> this is a picture that you have since done, and this was... I think around the time that you were still on SNL, I think, and you were doing amazing impressions of the devil. You'd always poof up as the devil. Uh, And this is you actually (laughs) between two torches with the face, (laughs) with the actual face of Satan. Uh, Yeah, that was Hawaii. That's that's how I enjoyed my vacation. (laughs) 
having you. I have pictures you. somewhere too of, of you and your daughters lounging. And what do you use them for? Lasciviously. Oh God. I have I have a question for you because you I, I you were in the Groundlings before. By the way, I, said, I don't know if you remember that was a, I, I had a, a girlfriend and, and her son Perry who was ten, and now yes, he's I do, I do recall. That's wonderful. Do you keep in contact with him? Yeah. Yeah. Is he not, like so the, he dropped the restraining order? You just don't know when to stop. You're just so funny. You were you always were you always funny? Mind. Were you, were you <laughs> why do you have to do this from the inside of a fucking zoo? Um did, my dog, he always tries to upstage me. Well it worked. Did, oh, we'll were, you, were you funny at five? Were you funny at ten? When, no, when I'll tell you, you a story though. It's funny you say that. I the reason I well, anyway, what happened when I was five? Uh, I slept over at a, a, a friend's house. My dad was a doctor. He had a nurse, and she had um, uh, two kids, Michael and Greg. And so I was five, and so Michael was four. And Greg was six. And, you know, but when you're five, th at that age, in my mind, four was like way younger than me. And six was like, that's the older big guy, you know. You know, and then you go, like, it was a year. But anyway, I spent the night at their house. And so, and Michael had twin beds in his room. So the point is, I so his mom goes, go to sleep. Well, it was about nine at night. And I didn't, I didn't know how to close my eyes to go to sleep. I couldn't do it because I was so awake and I'd, I'd be like, and I go, I don't know. I'd hear it, people would do that. I think, I don't know how they do that. So I would just lay there and just staring and wait, just wait till I could, fell asleep. And it was, I was hoping, I go, I wonder if I can catch the moment when I just passed, you know, go to sleep. Of course I never could. But anyway, I'm just laying there waiting to go to sleep and there's a light coming in the room and I could see Michael laying there. And all of a sudden he just popped up from his bed. At, like after 15 minutes, he just goes, <laughs> and make this face at me. So I started, I went, so I started laughing and then he laid down right away. And then like, and I was, I don't know, what? and then he went, and then he did it again and laid back like he was sleeping. And so I'm like, and he kept doing it. I was dying laughing, crying. And that's the moment I thought I want to be funny uh, like Michael. And that's, that's when it started. Did you stay friends with him? Do you still know? I don't. Hmm. He probably watched I mean, you all I, these years. Happened. I don't know what happened. The woman didn't work for my dad anymore. Right. So you were funny all through school and. Well, I was funny. Yeah. And then I, and then I would, uh, you know, yeah, I was just, I didn't know I was funny, but I liked being around funny people. I had, let's see what stuff I would do. Like uh, in third grade, we had a teacher, Mrs. Morton. And so there was, you know, Morton salt and I had a commercial. So one right. time she was asking some question about something and I raised my hand. She goes, Johnny. And I go, and I, I go, I, or I go, Mrs. Morton, I have a, she goes, yes, Johnny. I go, when it rains, it pours more than salt. <laughs> and she was very good. <laughs> I just, I did stuff like that. And then when we, uh, oh, in eighth grade, where uh, I have like uh, me and five other friends, we all been friends since eighth grade. One was a, uh, one is Lisa Kudrow's brother, David, who I met when I was 11. Another guy, Peter Richmond. Peter, it was a, they're about, David's a neurologist. All my friends are doctors. Peter's a surgeon. I met Peter when I was three in preschool. But in eighth grade, I met these other guys. One of them, Johnny Andrews, whose dad was Ty Andrews on the Mod Squad. John was very oh, yeah. popular in junior high because we go, his dad's on the Mod Squad, you know, with Captain Greer. And oh, Ty Andrews is a great actor. Great, helped me a lot. Great guy. But anyway, we're all in this class. Is eighth grade we met, so we were all just goofing off, and and so like one time we had to bring in song, song in, uh, oh song interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> so you know I was thirteen, so I brought in Lay Lady Lay, Bob Dylan, <laughs> 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 and then she goes Lay. So then they play the song, and then I get up and go Lay Lady Lay. Lay across my big brass bed. And she's like, all right, that's enough. I go, what? He just wants you to lay in the bed. What? What's the problem? 
Chris. So every th- your comedy was like mine. It would kind of always went to a lascivious place or an immature place because we laugh at poop oh, humor. Oh, immature, yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's you punch, funny. You punch, you punch, punch Hardy, me in the I, arm. Laurel you, and Hardy, you, you, I didn't understand them. And then when I got older, now I think they're hilarious because it's like two grown men acting like they're eight. And I, that, I would describe right. me. Yeah, it's, it's, it's... Same here. I, I go... That's one of the things that I love <laughs> is that silliness. <clears throat> How long have you had the COVID? Uh, I think since it started. I was in China. <laughs> have you stand up show? Have you been? Well, you were in a league of their own. Tested five times. Five. <laughs> Am I you, supposed to look at the camera? Or look at you. Whatever you're comfortable with. Look at me. I look at you. I'm looking okay, at what you. What am I? Does it look like now? I'm looking at. It doesn't really matter. All I see is a dog and a cat. <laughs> mm-hmm. Here's a here's a pun that you won't laugh at and make fun of me and tell me why I'm not funny, which is you were in a league of their own and you were great in it, and that was a, a big movie for you to be in at the time, correct? Well, yeah. Well, what happened, it was, um, it was uh, a Penny Marshall is a dear friend, God bless her, and so there was yeah. a third movie she put me in. And that movie was supposed to be made the year before, with Jim Belushi in the as the as the Tom Hanks role that Tom did, and um, different women. I think Elizabeth Shue was supposed to be one of them, and I don't know if it was Daryl Hannah and a different director, David Onspach, who had directed Rudy and um, and Hoosiers. Anyway, I don't know what happened, but it, it didn't happen. Then a year later, Penny's doing it, and I th- anyway, I love the part. But one reason I liked it. Well, one reason I think it was so funny, a main reason really, is because the writers, Lowell Gans and Babalu Mandel, and they'd written the movies Splash and Parenthood. They were main writers on Happy Days. And yep. they always said to me, we wrote this part for you. And then, and, the, and it's a true story, you know, but, but the other characters, like, like um, Tom Hanks' character, Jimmy Dugan, I think, is kind of based on Jimmy Fox, but not totally. They also made it up. Or the women characters, they kind of combine people. But when they wrote my part, they had me in mind when they wrote it. And my point is that not be, that none, if they, they had a specific actor in mind when they wrote the part. So if, if they'd written it, you know, the, whoever they had in mind for that part, you know, it was very specific and clear who, who was going to play it. So it, it just, so, I, you know, I'm only in the movie maybe 15 minutes, but the part was so well defined. And I think it's because, I know it's because they had me in mind when they wrote it. Now, of course, if they had another actor in mind, then he'd have been perfect for it. You know what I mean? So they had the Absolutely. whole Absolutely. It's whoever's part it is. Whereas the yeah. other characters, they were just making up. They didn't have a specific uh, person in their head. You see what I mean? Yeah. So Which also makes it, e- it, it must have been just a, a dream for you because it e- it's easy to learn something. It's easy. Well, it was really fun it- because, uh, I mean, I'm not like that character, but but I just remember reading it and, and just saying to my manager, I don't care how much they pay me. I have to play this part. This is so funny. I could just see it. And then I explained to and Penny. And who, who, who was your manager? Was it Mark or Bernie? Mark Gervitz, yeah, at Brillston, yeah. And then, and then um, when I got on the set, Penny goes, oh, no, I called her up. And I go, can I tell you how I see the part? And she kind of laughed like, I don't think she did. She goes, okay. But she wasn't like taking it seriously. I go, well, the guy is, you know, if I just play it like, straight he's so it just comes off as mean so i don't think he's mean i just but i think he just says stuff he can't help himself because he, it's like he, i just made it up like he was this which he you know a regular scout and now the guy goes go find women to play baseball and he's like women oh you know because you gotta you know acting you gotta go why am i saying this what am i thinking so like i have lines yeah. like all right you don't want to play i don't care you know and, and so that's kind of was his attitude you know, what was her response when you said, I don't want to play a mean because no, she just was like, I don't think she, she didn't really care about that. She's like, okay. Yeah. Cause she, I don't I think, think she thought it was kind of funny that I was trying to explain to her how I see it. But, yeah, right. but in, also John, you couldn't come off mean anyway, you know, unless you're playing a very serious role, like in happiness um, when you're in that, which was definable to me, except for this podcast where there's a fucking cat and a dog walking around for no I can't reason. come off mean. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> 
You do punch. So, you have punched me in the arm I before. Dead, yeah, I keep wanting to bring that up. You have a strong punch, and you sometimes, like a nine-year-old, will punch a guy in the arm. Am I right? Yes. When you go and why, too far. why do you do that when I go too far? Well, because I can't think of anything to say. <laughs> Is that why they call it a punchline? Good night, everybody. And you and think coronavirus started in a league of their own because you were up at bat? Hello? You would hit me really hard right oh, now. Oh, I get it. Oh, a bat. Yeah, it's a bat. That joke is bat shit crazy. I'm going to write about how bad that is in the comments on YouTube. <laughs> of what I said. You know. The cat is masturbating right, you know, behind you. John, it. the cat is masturbating on your head. This what is, is that? This is not a bra for my breast. This is my mask. It's very pretty. Hand sanitizer. <laughs> Not a joke, Bob. No, it's Carrot Top. It's great. <laughs> stare me down. That's what Zoom is for. We just stare oh, at each other. I thought I could make you believe the screen froze, but the cat's moving behind me. No, no, you have literally... At least it's not upstaging me. No one's it's listening insane. to what I'm saying. He's watching the cat like me. I thought it was well, CGI'd. Anyway. You have the craziest Zoom background I've ever seen. I'm glad this is mostly going to just be heard by people because if they look at this, it is it, when they when I post it, you know, when you put your assets out, you know, when you show your pieces of the podcast, it will just be the dog and the cat. You doesn't matter if you're talking or not. Yeah, they don't know what's happening. No, they're no one does. Life. They're free. You're, you're unpredictable. Um, I have a question oh, for either you. They're on. I, Wait, I want to tell you. So. This is my third movie with Penny. So when I get to the set, she goes, go pick out what you want to wear. So I picked out stuff. Oh, my cat that my grandfather would wear from the 40s. And then she said, and I grew a little mustache. He didn't have one, but I dressed like him. My, oh. Do you have, a, is there any chance you have a gerbil in your ass right now? Mm, this cat's attacking Please me. Please so. take your pussy away from the screen. So then, Bob. Yeah. And then she goes, you got to get a haircut. I go, oh, really? I have to? She goes, it's the 40s. She goes, yeah. I went, yeah, okay. So that's the only thing she, about my character. She said, get a haircut. But like I knew after, you know, this is my third movie with her. Penny, uh, like directors, they'll, you know, they're good at different things. But one thing that made her great was, well, she knew where the comedy was, of course, but she was a great physical comedian. So her blocking was like, you blocking is, you know, there's your own know, It's like, you know, where you stand or where you walk to a point. You might you walk over here, then you walk over here, then you sit down, then you do this, whatever. <laughs> they like, that's called blocking. Well, I don't is know this why. your master they class? Walking, they call it blocking. <laughs> so anyway, if they said walking, you'd go walk over here and sit there. What are you doing? It's where you walk and sit. Well, why don't you just say that? Do you have to come up with a different word for it? Anyway, they do. So anyway. Why do they call someone that uh, uh, helps you with cables and stuff a grip? I mean, it sounds like he could have a sickness from like the. Like he's a monkey because he can grip the cable? I don't know. Yeah. So anyway, the. Uh, the craft uh, service. Why do they call it craft reason. service? They call it. You mean the food? They call it crab service. Like craft service. You have crab service. No, but I have a joke about that craft service thing in a minute. So anyway. What is it? It's not a joke. It's a real thing. But so I'll say so anyway, she's great at physical <laughs> comedy. So I'm in the barn and she goes, where do you want to walk? move? Right. When I go, you tell me because I knew whatever I go, whatever I think of, you'll come up with something way better. It was just her instinct was so dead on. So she's yeah. like, well, I don't know. Maybe you walk over here and then maybe you walk to the cow and then you say, you know, they're milking him. Does that hurt the cow? No. And then turn around and go, well, it would bruise the hell out of me. And I go, all right. And I was really excited because I was really excited because I knew that her blocking was like, it was like magic. I can't explain it. it was just, anyway, I did the thing and I go to the cow and I turn around. Well, it bruised the hell out of me. When I turned around to say the line, it was like the line was just being jerked out of me. I can't explain it. It was so perfect. It was crazy, you know, and it was great. And then the uh, you know, I, at the time, I was really good friends with Tom Hanks and Rita. I knew his wife and, and, uh, and I knew right. Tracy, her daughter, and I knew Penny. And Gina Davis and Madonna, I already knew from when they hosted SNL. So it was a really fun movie, working with a lot of people I know. And then Rosie O'Donnell, it was her first movie, and she kept going, 
she goes, you know, it's my first movie, my first movie, and I can't believe I'm meeting Madonna, you know. And we went to see Rosie do stand-up, and she started imitating me on stage, and she goes, I can't believe John Lovitz is here watching me do stand-up, you know. And then it's just interesting, and then she became, you know, Giant. So the whole thing for you was that that it, was your, was your really one of your first dream experiences in a movie, even though you'd done other movies. Well, before. I loved it because, yeah, because uh, I love base. I wanted to be a baseball player growing up and I loved baseball. We're on Wrigley Field. And then it felt like I was making a movie from the 40s, which I love old movies. And it's arguably the most beautiful, most beautiful stadium that exists. Yeah. And there were Wrigley Stadium, right which was stu- built in 1914, looked the same. And then there's right. all these, like, 40 beautiful women. I love women. You do love women, John. I don't know if, if I'm... You don't you know, know if you're straight, but you love women. No, no, I love women. I don't know if that offends you. Oh, anyway, oh no, you could, you could say you love women. Uh, do you love men? I mean, I have affection for you, John. Friends, I would say... I- as friends... Well, love doesn't just mean sexual, John. John? <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, like pandemic has brought people out. Well, if I say I love my dog, it doesn't mean sexual? In your case, it does. It does mean that. John, you, were, you oh, started... Oh, wait, I want to in... say something I said earlier about craft service. Please. You know... So people might go, what's craft service? It's, <laughs> it's, the, it's the catering on a movie. They, they get a, and they get a food truck, you know, and the guy's in a truck and uh, people like me going, can you make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Sure, John, again, yes. And they're making sandwiches. They're in a food truck making food. They're great people. And, and, but that's their job in the catering. So you hear a director, you know, I'm very open-minded. I'll listen to anybody uh, who has a good idea for the movie. I'll listen to craft service. And I remember when idiot director said once, I go, oh, really? So if I suggest you won't listen to it, but the guy that never read the script and is, is in a truck making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, him you'll listen to. Oh, that's a brilliant <laughs> idea, you idiot. Well, it's collaborative. And a no, good idea can come from moronic. anybody. It's the, it's the, <laughs> there's so many things that they say that are so moronic. I'll even listen to craft service. You mean somebody that's never made a movie, a guy that makes that makes egg salad sandwiches and, and is in a truck and doesn't have anything, never read the script, never shot a piece of film, never did anything in acting. But he can have a good <laughs> idea. John, he's what if the scene, wait a minute, what he's if the scene. He's not have any idea. It's may stupid. I? May I? What can you imagine if? a surgeon, a surgeon going to do eye a surgery? Surgeon? My uncle, Robert Abraham, look it up. The Abraham Lens, a very famous, world famous eye doctor. Imagine my uncle Bob going, Well, we're going to operate on your eye. Hang on. I want to call the guy in the corner with the food truck. Do you think we should do this? I mean, it's ridiculous, Bob Saget. It's the stupidest idea ever. That's not (laughs) open minded. That's idiotic. John Lovitz, if that's your name. If it's a scene about a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, that would be a great contribution. He could say you add banana, you don't, and then the director could say that's a great idea to the craft service person. Instead of you diminishing the working man, especially at this time in our world. (laughs) I'm not diminishing the working man. I'm just saying you don't go to a guy. I'm sorry, your witness is sustained. Scene in a movie. And they've never done it. They've never gone. And I think I was on this. What do we do? What do I do? I'm like, I don't know. Why don't you ask the guy in craft service? Maybe he'll come up with the solution. Okay. This brings me up. This brings me up. This brings up a thing that I've thought about you the whole time. I just did a Groundlings workshop for a year, right? Just a workshop. You oh, were in I the company. I talk all about it. I was one of uh, you the Groundlings is. I, I know. How many years were you in the Groundlings? A wonderful improv troupe well, in the LA. Groundlings is an improv. Well, yes. I said... You know, they're all connected. They started with um, the Compass players in Chicago, and that became Second City. And then people from Second City went to Chicago and started a group called The Committee. And then a guy named Gary Austin from, came to Los Angeles and started a workshop called The Crown. And then became a theater, a theater improv group, sketches, and they get people from Saturday Night Live. Lorraine Newman was the first. I was the second. Now, what? I was in it for three years. I took... They had class, they had uh, three levels, beginning, intermediate, advanced, but there wasn't, it wasn't like it is today. It wasn't like everyone's doing it to get on SNL. 
which was never my never entered my mind. Yeah, tell me tell me about that because you also have always had an affinity for characters from the 30s and 40s and 50s movies, and that kind of entered everything you did in all the characters. Because to be scoring on SNL is to come up with characters that are unique to you that you find funny. So why don't you embellish on that as you trash craft service a little bit more? Well. And blocking. Explain blocking again, because I, I forgot to sleep. Blocking is the it's where go you go back to how you develop these they, characters that are they, so funny, they, like where you move. They go blocking. Like, yes, it is. You got that. I have that. We we have that recorded. It's like but what saying about, when you go to the bathroom, take a gulp of air, push your face so it turns bright red and and tighten your stomach muscles. Or you mean push? It's like that. So blocking is like taking a crap? Yeah, just push. <laughs> so, they make it all they overcomplicate it. Okay, let me cut to the chase. Where did acting so the where did your acting, acting acting? Did that come out of a groundling sketch? Uh well, it started um I was in uh, I went to UC Irvine as a drama major and William Needles, a great actor, is like a, a great man, taught us Shakespeare. He was in the Stratford Festival in Canada. And um I, he was teaching us Shakespeare. And so, and he worked with great actors. He was like one, he was a founding member of the Stratford Festival in Canada, which is like the, the second best uh, rate, whatever, one of the best repertory theaters in the world. Uh, and people like Brian, Maggie Smith would be there. And she talks about Bill, isn't it Bill Needles, how, how much he influenced her. He was just great, great man. Very, very kind man. And I was like 18 and he must've been 59. So he would say, well, hello, everyone. He goes, I'm going to teach you Shakespeare. So this is the, uh, I'll do some for you now. This is from the opening chorus, the opening speech of the chorus from Henry V. <clears throat> oh, for the muse of fire that will ascend the brightest heaven of invention. And I was like, what the fuck is that? I'd never heard anything like it. And for some reason, I could imitate him. <laughs> and so it started with that. And then I would be playing baseball with my friend David I want to be an actor. I go, I'm the master thespian, any part, any time, anywhere, you know. And then when I started, uh, I took class in the Groundlings, they had like a beginning class, then you had to move, you got, then they decided if you moved on to intermediate. And yeah, I, got I did moved both on of those. Advanced. I got moved on to advanced. Right. And uh, it was like the class. And, like, and then you were in the company, right? That, that would be spread out. They go, when, it, when the intermediate, when another session starts, you can do. So, but, it took but to, for you to the, listen, just listen to the question. Well, I'm telling you, I know that. So but when you I got graduated the, in a way. Yeah. But when I got in the groundlings in, in the advanced class, that you had to do scenes and characters. So that's when I started doing Master Thespian as a character. And I had a great teacher there, Randy Bennett, who really helped me. So that's when I started doing it there. But it was a combination of like, I love Basil Rathbone <clears throat> as Sherlock Holmes yep. and John Carradine, uh, uh, the actor, you know, they had huge voice. You know, John Carradine, you see him in uh, um the Ten Commandments, and and you hear, you know, Charlton Hess is like, well, we've got to do something. And then you hear John Carradine going, yes! You know, it was like a cannon. And you hear it <laughs> reverberating off the sound. And I just, it's so theatrical and huge, but it's just funny to me. And John Barrymore, great actor, and, oh, you know, and, and I just was, I just found it like, they were thrilling <laughs> actors. They were great. Even Lawrence Olivier, you know, he would settle, and he goes, you know, and, you know, he would just do stuff. It goes, Henry V, and he's giving his speech. He goes, and then we, the line is on St. Crispin's Day is the end of the speech. He goes, and then we'll march on on St. Crispin's Day. <laughs> <laughs> and I just was like, you know, it was just uh, funny and thrilling to me. And so it was a combination of that and William Needles. So that's how that character. And then I, I did it on SNL. And then I just, and then I was, did it with John Lithgow three times. And, uh, Robert Smigel came up with the time I did it with, um, uh, he goes, what if a master thespian was Santa Claus at Macy's? And it was, <laughs> it was a funny, and then we wrote that together. That was a, that was a good one. He's oh, wonderful. Oh, oh, Merry Christmas. Oh, that's funny. In that sketch, right? There's a kid, a kid in the sketch, the, the cute little, uh, the girl, David and Julie, they're like five. They're so cute. And he was so, anyway, I'm on that thing cameo, Right. Yeah, uh, you know, little videos and uh, cameo.com. I'm plugging it. But anyway, the point is, <laughs> just last week, I get a request for a cameo from the, David, who was fight from his wife. 
She goes, oh, he's 38, now, or he's like 38. Or something. She goes, he was the kid in Mass of Thespian. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, he was 38. Were, were you? It, funny? Yeah, it is, it is weird. It is weird. Like, um, but if you, you watch know. that, those, forget me. Those kids were so cute. He was like the sweetest boy. It almost made me cry. In fact, he's the kid where I go, I'm, you know, the, uh, uh, Phil Hartman is playing the manager. So we play, play it like Frank Nelson, like, yes. So he fires me, right? And I go, Oh, firing Chris Canning, Chris Kringle. Oh, I'm dying. The manager, the manager. And if you look at it, the kids are looking. And David, he just instinctually, he's like, going, like reaching out to me. Going, yeah. <laughs> it was so sweet. I don't want to get blue, but um, I mean, blue no, sad. Old, old school, old school blue. Uh, not a verb either. But Phil Hartman was one of your dearest friends, right? Oh, yes. Like my older brother that I always wanted. Yeah. He was yeah. the king of the groundlings. And uh, I saw him in Chick Hazard and you were in it. I saw it live. You did? I was at the Groundlings Theater. I was going to, I was taking Groundlings classes. Oh, well, Chick. And I had been doing oh, stand up and I saw Chick. Yeah, I did the, the beginner's intermediate and then I did advanced intermediate and then I ended up getting some TV thing. I don't know. But you and. And, and, and in, working. No, not really working. Guest starring, not, crappy stuff. But. Um, no, but that was so brilliant, and I watched Phil in it, and how, um, my God, well, so, much so much dialogue, so much dialogue, and was that, it had to have been a great amount of improv, but it was severely scripted as well, correct? Oh, it was scripted, and then and then what happened was, it was the Olymp Olympic Arts Festival, it was the, 84, and it was the Olymp year of the Olympics in Los Angeles, so they had an Olympic Arts Festival, and they funded nine theaters to do original uh, shows, but it had to have the theme of the Olympics. So Phil had a character, Chick Hazard, which was like a spoof of like, you know, the, like the Humphrey Bogart detectives from the forties and right. Philip Marlowe. So they picked him and he was, he'd been in the groundlings for 10 years. He was like the king of the groundlings. We all looked up to him. So you could they see did he it. was a star from the moment he started talking. I mean, there was so much charisma, no, so, so much talented. charm, so talented. Yeah. The best. So, so they were doing the show. I was not in the show, but I, I'd done, been in the Sunday company for a year. And so I didn't, after six months, you get moved up. I wasn't. And then after a year, they still wasn't. They go, well, and then the director of it, Tom Axel said, why don't you see how we work together? And you can understand Jake Hazard, the play and see how we work together. Cause if you get in the company, I'll be, I'm the one you're going to work with. So let's see how we work together. Does that sound fair? I go, yeah, that's fair. Great. So I understudied the part. So that's what I, I got to do it. And because of that, I got in the groundlings. So I was very, and it was Phil's idea to have me understudy the part. Um, Isn't that weird that I saw you, I saw you, so I saw you in it. It had been running for yeah. a while and I, that's and so I remember cool. I got to see that. Groundlings, it's a 99 seat theater and there's a hallway where you can hang your clothes, the lockers. And I never met Phil. I'd never met him. And I saw him walking down the hall and, and he's all made up in his trench coat and his makeup. And he's like this, you know, from the forties. And I sign, I go, I go, oh, hey, Phil, I, I, I go, I'm, I, I'm John Lovitz. Yeah, I know who you are. I go, you do? He goes, yeah. I go, oh, well, thanks for, you know, suggesting I, because I said to Tom Maxwell, I said, who's, well, whose idea was there for me to understudy the part? And he goes, Phil. I went, oh, I go, and I went, Phil? Phil knows who I am. That's how big he was. I didn't, you know, I just, and so I go, thanks for recommending me. He goes, oh, yeah, I've seen you work. You'll be, you'll be fantastic. And he kept walking. And I never, I remember thinking, oh, my God. God, Phil Hartman spoke to me. I mean, that's how much he was revered there, you know. And so because of that, I got in the groundlings. I just, you know, uh, it was like a puppy knock. Phil, Phil, Phil. You know, he's like nine years older than me. And so, and he was the only guy who had a new car. He had a job. Everyone was broke, but not him. He had money. So when he goes, hey, and then he had a house. I go, hey, I want to see your house. He goes, okay. So he invited me. I went, it was in the valley. It was a little house. But I wanted to see it. And he had a little house. He goes, you know, you're the first person from the groundlings I've ever had over to my house. I, go, I am. Why? He goes, well, I don't know. I'm just, you know, I'm private. But he, yeah, we were very, very close. Like, how did the SNL uh, thing go? Did he was he on it first, and then you came and went to no, it? No, I was on it first. You keep seeming to say that, but I thought I remembered him being on it first. That's because you've probably had a stroke. And your memory's messed up. <laughs> what you year? What year did I have that stroke? Two seconds to look up the cast from eighty-five to eighty-six. 
you I've got pages yeah. on you. I don't want to fucking read anymore. I've known you for 35 years. So question oh, for- Actually, the, 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 the night that I, the first time I did the show, A Chick Hazard, and yeah, there was, it was written and then there's spots, there would be spots where you would improvise. So they go, like you'd go, you're saying all this and they ask you, well, how did, tell us the story of this. And that was like, you're cute to improvise a story. So it was really fun show to do. And, um, and there was a girl, Lynn Stewart, who was m- m- Miss, uh, she's on Pee Wee Herman's Playhouse, Miss uh, the Ballerina, you know, the pretty girl. Uh, yeah. Lynn was in the show. And so my, when I would make up a story on stage, I was just trying to make Lynn laugh. Like that, I was, you know, I'm not the most disciplined actor. I'm going, how can I make Lynn laugh? You right. Know? But anyway, I did the show the first night and Lorraine Newman came to the show and she was doing the movie Perfect and she brought John Travolta. We're like, Lorraine Newman and John Travolta. Geez. Anyway, she came backstage after the show and with John, she goes, hi, hi, I'm Lorraine. I go, I know, nice to meet you. So she goes, well, how long have you been doing this show? And I go, this is my first night. She goes, no, 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 but really how long? I go, no, this is my first night. She's like, will you stop fucking around? Like how long? I go, no, I'm telling you, it's my first night. I'm understanding. <laughs> she was like, you're kidding. I go, no, I, 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 anyway, so my point is she befriended me uh, after that. And, and then I, and then later on, I, I, I got in the Tonight Show from the Groundlings doing my liar character. They got me an agent, my guidance that I got auditioned to a movie, Charles Grodin. So Lorraine and Charles Grodin uh, recommended me Lorne Michaels because uh, he was back in 85 looking for people for the, a new cast. Anyway, I, I I, I end up getting the show because them and then th- those two they also recommended Phil and I recommended Phil and everything, and but the truth is that Phil got the show the second year because they go we, they kept Dennis Miller and Nora Dunn and I and then they and they let everyone else go which I was sad about because I really liked everybody and it was you know and it was like the cast was like you know Randy uh, Quaid and and Robert Downey Jr. and Anthony Michael Hall and Terry Sweeney and Joan Cusack and and Denitra Vance and uh, uh, very talented people and so. But they go, who do you work well? So I was pushing four people from the groundlings and they hired Phil. But And Phil got the show and he turned it down. Did you know that? No. no. Why well, did you he turn it down? Because he goes, no, I like my life. I don't want to be, you know, famous. And I remember when, when I recommended Phil to Lauren and Phil goes, well, how long has Lauren? Phil, Lauren said, how long has Phil been in the groundlings? I said, like 11 years. He goes, and he hasn't made it yet. Don't you think there's a reason? I was like, yeah, I guess. But in my <laughs> mind, but he's so talented. I, I, I remember saying to Lauren, I go, if you like me, you think I'm good, you'll love Phil. He's a genius, you know? Right. And and I said, well, and he didn't want it. You know, he goes, I have my, I like writing screenplays. I, my, I make enough money. I don't want to be famous. Anyway, he turned it down. And and then I said, Phil, you got to do it. Are you crazy? We'll have so much fun. It'll be so great. So then he, anyway, he changed his mind and he did the show. So I remember going to him, I go, so did you? Did I convince you to change your mind? That's why you did it? He's like, no. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> no why credit. You change your mind? Yeah, I wanted the credit. And in, and in retrospect, so Lauren I said, says, why change he- your mind? He goes, Joel Silver. We did a movie. He goes, Joel called me up and said, you're crazy not to do this. Like, right. Fine. Well, in retrospect, when I've talked to Lauren, Lauren said that Phil was the anchor for that time period. Not that you weren't. Here's the truth about Phil. I always said he... And he would always make fun of himself. But I said, Phil, you and Jim Carrey, you're the only two guys I know that you can like change your face and look right. like the character you're playing without makeup. I go, it's like magic. And he'd go, well, that's, yeah, I'm Mr. Potato Head. You knew him so well. And it, it, we can do. just be honest here. Yes. Um, with me, I would see him. I saw him often. I mean, relatively. And every time I saw him, he would just go, hello, Bob. <laughs> like he like he was in character. <laughs> like it's good to see you. Like he was making fun of wanting he was actually happy to see me, but it was wasn't but it was like making well, fun of the moment. Comedian. He was trying to make you laugh. Yeah, and he did because he was so fucking charming. Oh, and I do wow. want to say um it, it is a huge I'm the sad. nicest guy ever and the all I can say is I don't I don't participate in those documentaries about him because they're I'm just telling you Yeah, that's all crap. It, they're a bunch of crap. Nobody that was really close to him is doing it or talking, you know, and they, and they're making shit up and it's just, a well, that was crap. all the each Hollywood story type of stuff. That was all about tragedy. They just did another one. And I go, I'm not, I'm, they go, Oh, it's going to be about celebrating his life. And I'm like, no, it isn't. 
And of course it wasn't. And they're right. just making shit up. And I just go, I'm not participating in that. You know, I, uh, it, first of all, I, I wouldn't talk about it as private life because it's private. Yeah. And that can, that the people are like baffled by that idea. Like, well, no, because they think everybody should just be chatty Cathy's about all of it. It's such bullshit. No. I mean, I did the Chris Farley documentary because I was the last person. I was in that too. Yeah, I heard you cried in it like a. Like, <sighs> well, I was the last crying? person that directed him in Dirty Work. Uh, that was his last. You directed it? Yeah, that was his last movie. I wanted to oh. get you so it would be your last movie. But um... <laughs> I loved him. And um, I'm in that too. I was close friends with Chris. I mean, Aaron was watching. I wasn't as close as you were, but I just like a lot of people. Again, no, no. But Chris and I knew each other. I'm closer to Dave Coulier and John Stamos than you. Did you know that? You're closer to everyone, especially your dog and your. I'm closer to your (sighs) own children. (laughs) (laughs) I'm gonna. I'm pressing charges. (laughs) Um, we've watched a lot of people now. We're not kids, but we're not old because we know older people than us that are well, comedy. We're older than people in their twenties. We are older than most. There comes the cat. <laughs> people are going to need to see this on YouTube. This is a uh, this is a lot to take. Um, how close are you with that cat? Very. Did you want to send me some pictures? Because I have it's a feeling a you. I don't know. We're getting to know each other. Oh, Jerry the dog is, one's part of this love, go. too. He wants to be on. He's, he's Look at him. John, during quarantine... Jerry, he knows that we're on a Zoom call, and he wants to be on camera. That's how smart he is. He's he like doesn't look it. He's hun- hunching over. The dog wants to be on camera. The cat does not. I have a, a big question to ask you, which is, do you miss doing stand-up right now? I do, yeah. Yeah. But uh, that's going to, yeah, it's, you know, it's funny. People go, you can't joke about anything anymore. I go, well, what do you, then don't go to a comedy club. I mean, you, I mean, what are you going to do? Not make yeah. jokes about anything. And then there's, you don't have a show. I mean, I thought, I always say people go, well, I'm offended. I go, look at, I make fun of myself. I mean, I, I make fun of everybody. And the point of it is, I, it, it's not mean. I just, you just, you know, you make jokes. And if you can't laugh at yourself, you shouldn't go to a comedy club. That's the last place you should go. Right. But people go, well, I don't like this humor. You shouldn't say that joke. I go, no, I'll say what I want. You you do your act and you say what you want. If you don't like it, don't show up. Right. Now, what about uh, the jokes that you've been doing about me for so many years, John? So many. Everybody just, everyone contacts me. It's on my Twitter feed, on my Instagram. Yeah, Bob, you know what John's saying about you? Yeah, why you? would they ask me if I know? I've known you forever. So um, it used to well, be. I won't explain it. I would make dumb jokes about my manager. and it, uh, Who is it a friend of both of ours. Yeah. And then I was doing it in the clubs and I realized nobody knows uh, who he is. So I did the laugh factor and I went to you. You heard the stuff. I said, Bob, can I make it about you? Because no one knows who he is. You go, yeah, that's fine. I didn't and say then, it like that. I went like this. Um, is there anybody else that you can no, make you it about? <laughs> you liar. You said, yeah. If you look up, look at your screen. Do it anymore. You see, that? see that up there? There's the roast. There's the roast of me, the poster of the roast. And um, you didn't want to do it at the roast on comedy central be, uh, where you make fun of me and sing songs about me, um, saying that I am, you know, I didn't think you'd like it. I don't know why. All right, go. I'll send for my act. No, you I, didn't. You, you were like, I want to say, I want to sa- save it for something else. We're like, but this is kind of the perfect place to do it. <laughs> I know. I don't know. I forget why I didn't, I didn't want to. You were you. hilarious on that roast, by the way, that was very painful for me. Kinda, that roast kind of cut me. I know they go after everybody. I'm like, who are we roasting? I remember, I remember, I mean, I'm just, I don't like those as much. I don't, I, they have, it used to be, as you know, it would be the Friars Club and it was to raise money for charity. And the Friars Club was, you know, a big uh, comedy, a uh, comedian uh, uh, club. Yeah, it and was so, a ph- and philanthropist that wanted to help yeah, people. Yeah, and the roast, they pick a comedian to roast, right? And but it would raise money for charity, and it was just for the members. So you'd on TV, you could never, you know, you couldn't cuss or anything. So it, what was funny was to see these comedians who could never do that kind of say cuss or anything in in public 
in private do it. It was, you know, it just be as dirty as you can. And it was funny because they couldn't do it anywhere else. And I remember the first one I went to uh, was a, a, a Bruce Willis was in the 80s or hosting and Milton Berle, I don't know what year it was. He was 90, 83. He was the master of ceremonies. And Gloria already made a big stink. They should let women in. They should let women. It was up for men only, you know. They, and so anyway, they did. And then it was at the Beverly Hilton. And, and Milton, they go, now our MC, Milton Berle. And the whole room got quiet and like was tittering, like, here we go, you know. And then he just started in and it was, and he did about eight minutes and it was like hilarious. And his timing was right. so perfect. It was unbelievable. And I remember going, who can, how can you follow that? And I, I didn't do it though. I just went, I sat on the dais, but I didn't want to do it because I go, I don't have an act and I, I can't compete. But I remember they did it and um, it was hysterical. And and then Danny Aiello got honored about three years later. So I did, I go, Danny, do you want me to do it? He goes, yeah, just go ahead. So I, you know, but none of my jokes were mean. They were, they were like, you know, they were silly. And right. I, don't, I think there's a big difference between doing jokes that, you know, they tease you, but they're not mean. And but a lot of the stuff on kinds of they're like mean. And I, I go, well, my my <laughs> roast was one of the few that wasn't that mean because it was my friends. You know, it was literally everybody. I had just met Greg Giraldo and then we became close after that. And then unfortunately we lost him. Um, but but Norm was on it. Norm read the sports section it, while everyone else was giving their <laughs> their roasting comments. He was pretty hilarious, but you were wonderful Norm, on it. I love Norm. Thank you. <laughs> I do that all the time. And my <laughs> wife, it drives her crazy. She'll go, it's a really nice day outside. I'll say, thank you. And, <laughs> and she's like, who do you think you are? I said, well, who does it sound like I think I am? <laughs> when I was 12, I remember my dad went, I don't know, I was 12 and he goes, I don't know what he was talking about. He went, he went, oh God. He wasn't talking to me so much. He was, oh God. And I was 12. I went, yes. <laughs> and then he was went, your dad yeah. funny. Where did you inherit yeah, he this? Be, but he could be serious. He, I go, yes. And he goes, don't do that. <laughs> but you also <laughs> are very serious. Course, and so, it, wait, but you're, you're hilarious. You can't help it. It's who you are. It's you always have been hilarious. It's hard not to look at you and get ready to laugh. Well, you see, but yes, <clears throat> it's like the great Gildersleeve. You again? I know. It's like it's like I said. To, I go. I go. I can't imagine a woman in bed with me. Like I'm in bed with her. And I'm like, well, no and one can, now John. I'm in. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't work. But um. <laughs> I didn't want to work. You see, I, I'd see people work and they hated it. And my dad was a very successful doctor, but he always said I wanted to be a singer. And I go, I don't want to like spend my life eight hours a day doing something I hate. I mean, that's just like fucking hell. So when are you going to change so, careers? Oh, I want to be paid to be me, you know, right. I, so I don't have to actually work. Now, well, there's this thing called acting and comedy. What's that you go that you get paid for going what's that and i go perfect <laughs> <laughs> but of course then you learn and then I, I ended up doing a play in 11th grade and um a friend of mine david rosemont uh i was i went to harvard which is now harvard westlake but it was all boys at the time and there was an all girl school argyle and they're doing their first play and the man who came to dinner to dinner and he said you know they need guys in the play so he goes, John, there's a lot of great parts. He says, I'm playing the lead, but there's a lot of great parts. And there's a lot of great girls. And I go, okay. And I ended up playing three parts in the play. And I did it. And I got all this applause and huge laughs. The prettiest girl in the school fell in love with me. So then I go to UC Irvine in the first acting class. And he, my teacher goes, all right, I want to ask him, why do you want to be an actor? And he goes, well, you know, I like, you know, theater. And I want to, you know, help the world with theater. And I want to do this. And they get to me. John, why do you want to be an actor? I go, the applause. <laughs> <laughs> and he went, he literally went, he went. Uh, and then he started smiling. He goes, well, I appreciate your honesty, but you know, you got to have more reasons than that to be an actor. And I'm like, why? Well, you just, <laughs> you do. And the next year, 
he cast me in the lead in this play, When You Coming Back, Red Rider. And I right. got so into just performing the play. And, and he was he had to teach me everything. Ashley Carr, great teacher, how to how to move on stage. I didn't know anything. And but we got so into like recreating the reality of the play and trying to make it, you know, a real experience that at a certain point I was like, I don't want the audience here. They're intruding on our work. You know, I went like the other way. Right. Like, why do we need them? This is about this, you know what I mean? And, and you get, you know, it's a little, both are a little extreme, but, but the truth is I, I do like the uh, performing life, but the thing is that what I don't like is dumb shit. People say who aren't comedians, right? They're just jealous because they're not funny. So they go, well, you know, comedians, they're all sad clowns saying, so, you no, know, you're sad. You know, or they go, what, uh, oh, they like doing stand up. They like the immediate response. They like, you know, it's, it's like, and why no. is that? Why is that a negative, by the way? <laughs> I, I don't know, but it's, it, it, I go, first of all, when you're doing comedy, you go, I go, which you've never done. The people that say that go, it's about the audience. J George Burns said they laugh or they don't. So, and it's timing and you're timing everything off the laughs. Well, you need people there. As you know, you're yeah. working, even though they don't know it, you're working off the audience and it's back when it goes back and forth, it just goes like this and it becomes a great show. And you need to hear their laughs for the timing. And you also need to know if your jokes are working or not is whether well, they laugh or not. Jerry Seinfeld do says that. It, movies very hard because you got to do the timing in your head it, because you, nobody can laugh on the set because the, 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 they're here in the, in, you know, on the sound and it ruins the, the, the take. But you, you know it. And you, it in your you, head. Yes. And you don't hold for laughs necessarily. And that can be done in editing if they need to hold for a laugh, if they test it and yeah, whatever. Yeah, but there's still timing. You know, I have, you know, who loves you, a filmmaker that loves you, Roman Polanski. Well, he loves you in a different way because you helped him get across the border when he was in trouble. And we'll be right back after this break. All right, everybody, this is a subject matter that is actually something I care a lot about, which is happiness and wishing happiness for all of you. And I've had my own struggles with being unhappy and having difficulties in life. I just want to add right now that this is a paid sponsorship and uh, they're a sponsor and I like them and they're called BetterHelp. So I have a question for you. What interferes with your happiness? You don't have to answer now. I'll just ask you a few more questions. Is something preventing you from achieving your goals? I've had many things that I thought things were over and then I realized it just doesn't matter and I was able to get help. I was able to talk to, you know, psychologists and therapists and figure out myself as I got older and learned how to be happy. BetterHelp will access your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. This didn't exist years ago. Connect in a safe place and a private online environment. It's just really convenient. And you can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not a self-help line. It is professional counseling done securely online. You can send a message to your counselor anytime. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can reschedule weekly video or phone sessions, all without ever having to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room. And nobody likes that, especially with other people around. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they can make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. The service is available for clients worldwide. Find the particular expertise you need online. Don't limit yourself to the counselors located near you. Licensed professional counselors, they specialize in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief, self-esteem. Anything that you share is confidential. It's convenient, professional, affordable. Check out the testimonials posted daily on their site. This is not a crisis line. In fact, so many people have been using better help that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. So I want you to start living a happier life today. And as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our better help sponsor at betterhelp.com slash bob. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Bob. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. And again, 
That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Bob. Okay, we're back. Um, I was talking to Jerry Zucker, who's a friend of mine, and I, I know he's a friend of yours, and every time I talk to him, he brings up his adoration for you. He always wants to do something with you. You were really funny in Rat Race, which was a, a fun movie that was trying to be like a mad, 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 mad world kind of movie, a road picture, and you were delightful in it. And, uh, and So explain maybe well, that experience. No, no, a mad, 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 mad world was in the 60s and it had all the biggest co- comedic actors in it. And With they were Spencer great. Tracy as the anchor. <laughs> yes, as, as the Phil. And so what happened was, was a, it wasn't a coincidence that it was trying to be like that. Sherry Lansing, who was the chairman of Paramount Studios, said she wanted a new, she commissioned Andy Breckman, who's a, a comedy writer, a friend of mine on SNL. I love him, yeah. Letterman. And to and wrote anyway, great. He, one of the only comedy writers that's actually also funny as a, in person. And he's a per- great guy. I did a guest star yeah. thing on The Good Cop, his show with Josh Groban and um, Tony Danza. He, I became instant yeah. friends with him. I had, I'd met him. What? I'm not allowed to talk about myself for 12 seconds out of your two hour interview. Sorry. <laughs> Who was that? Back to Andy oh, Breckman. Ring. Back to Andy Breckman. You go. I'm not no, talking who was anymore. I imitating? Give her credit. Uh, that would Barber. be Joanne Worley. From laughing. So anyway. Who I was in Drowsy Chaperone with. There it is up there on the poster. Uh, you were in the dinner party, right? On Broadway? Yeah. Yeah, right. Because I know you. Good. And you have nothing Very above good. you. It's a dinner party. You just have shades because you're slim shady. Do you because love, I don't did, need to post all my credits in the background. No, I have a new background. I used to be in my study. This is my second podcast. (laughs) No, you open it as you open it as fucking Noah's Ark with animals all over you. You know, you said something before this, before you went up. Yeah. Rat race, Jerry Zucker. So they, so she had a commission and then I got cast in it like a week before they started shooting. And I had an agent goes, well, if they don't cast Danny DeVito, they'll come to you. Well, they don't do this. This went on for like seven months. And I finally screamed at her. I go, shut up. I don't need to know anymore. What are you doing? Like, you're just torturing me? I don't right. know why agents did. Well, if they don't use so-and-so, they use you. I go, I, you know what? Just tell me when they want me. I don't need to know. Right. Oh, hi, you rejected again. Just want you to know. Bye. But hi. please keep this they month open. They don't want open. you, but they might. Well, keep you posted. Months right. later. All right. Well, nope. They don't want you. <laughs> It's like, okay, what do you, like, a fucking say? So anyway, I actually said to Jerry, are you sure you want me in this movie? Because I've been hearing about it for, like, over a year. And I go, it's like, he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Jason Alexander was supposed to play my part, and then he had a, a scheduling thing, like, the, and then I got cast the week before they started shooting. But so I it's almost like, like you that didn't that even do the movie. Jerry you Zucker's, did. like, the nicest guy. He's the so nicest, nice. and people that don't know uh he and his brother and Jim Abrams did Airplane and uh, Naked Gun and all those sequels and uh, Police Squad and a lot of great movies. By people who don't know, do you mean me or my dog? Uh, your dog. Jerry Bruckheimer the third. That's your dog, Jerry Bruckheimer? Yes. But Jerry Zucker also directed Ghost, John. Why weren't you in Ghost? I was. What'd you play? I played the clay on the potter's wheel <laughs> and they were supposed to make my penis and they didn't have enough clay oh they made a dreidel it was going around it was supposed to be yeah Ridge. and they held it, it was supposed to be like do you do you celebrate being jewish like at all do you, do you... <laughs> what what's your eight? favorite john do you you love acting uh, the most of all the things that you do, because you do a bunch of different things. I mean, well, you, you, you love stand up. Like, like all of it. I mean, I like all of it. You know, when it's going well, it's great. I mean, for instance, I did a movie with uh, uh, Kevin Spacey, who, uh, you know, uh, before his uh, mishaps. I'm sorry, and, uh, I don't know what you're referring to. Anyway, Kevin, you know, you're working with a great actor. Uh, it's, it's, it's fantastic, you know? Right. And, uh, I, I remember, um, 
I did the movie big and a small scene with Tom Hanks, but that was like, you know, it's Tom. And then you're, uh, w when you're working with great actors, it's, it's, uh, it's fantastic. You know, it's, it, cause you feel like, oh, I'm really in a movie. I mean, one time I did a movie, I mean, that wasn't a big one, 3000 miles from Graceland, but I knew Kevin Costner. And anyway, he called me up and goes, I want you to play this part. He goes, I have to kill somebody in the movie. And I said, it has to be John Lovitz. I'm like, oh, thanks a lot. He goes, but listen, the scene's not there, but if I promise you, I'll write a really good scene. It'll be about just three, three pages, but it's not there now, but I promise you I'll do it. And it'll be really good. Will you do it? I go, I said, yeah, yeah. He'll be dramatic. I go, yeah, I trust you. I'll, I'll trust you. Let's do it. You know, I'd be thrilled. And of course he was so great. And yeah. he's like playing a bad guy in the movie. And he's like glaring at me. And I thought, and I, we were doing one take and I went up to my car. Are you really mad at me? He goes, no. I go, oh, I mean, they're so good that they yeah. convince you that they're furious with you. I did. I, one time I did a movie, the great white hype. And I got to, I'd worked with him before, but Sam Jackson, Samuel, ja you know, Samuel Jackson, Sam. And, and I had this scene with him where he's like glaring at me and I went, are you mad at me? He goes, no. I go, oh, but, but you'd swear that you go, oh shit, this guy's really pissed at me. Right. Can't tell they're, I mean, they're so good and you know, it's a scene, you know, you're doing a movie, you know it, but they're still, they're so good that they're looking at you like you're going, oh shit. Like they're really mad at me. Like this is beyond acting, but that's how great they are. You know, I did a, and when I did a wedding singer, it was a fun part. Sandler asked me to do as a favor. And I go, well, let me think about it. And then I call them a couple hours later. I go, wait, you're saying I can like sing in a movie? I go, yes. What am I thinking? I've always wanted to do that. And Drew Barrymore, I knew since she was like 11. Right. I thought that'll be fun. So, so I do the thing. So I have the part of the scene where I'm just talking to her and, and, uh, and Adam. And, um, and in my mind, like Drew's doing her thing. And I'm like going, is she like, is she going to do, is she going to start acting? Like, what is she doing? And then like about five minutes later in my head, I went, idiot she is acting I can't exactly. tell. that's how good she is you can't tell i mean she's so good that you're just because she'll be talking to you and then you start the scene and it's no different you know people go what's that i go that's acting they don't understand it you know you're either doing a character you're playing yourself and and as anyone will say to play yourself is like it, it's 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 the art of subtlety where i'm not exactly subtle but it's that and um <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny even people Helen, do, Mirren, people, people Helen do. Mirren, a great actress, she does that thing. What's that thing uh, they have? Um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Helen Mirren, what's that thing on? Um, <laughs> I haven't spoken for two hours. No, on Facebook, you're about to say something rudely. <laughs> no. Uh, no, Master I wasn't. Class. Master yes. class. She walks to the chair and sits down and she goes, now what I just did was one of the most difficult things to do, to merely walk to a chair as yourself and sit down. It seems simple, but it isn't. Playing yourself is one of the most difficult things you can do. <laughs> <laughs> but that is true. People criticize people. Oh, my God. You know, Robert Redford always plays himself. It's like, no, he doesn't. And shut up. You know, Clint Eastwood no, no. always well, I'll tell you the plays himself. Thing, it's, I, I realize from acting, the easiest thing to do is to get a really play an eccentric character that's meaty and, and, and is like, very eccentric and does all these things and they're fun to do. It's a blast. You know, the hardest thing to do is to play just a, like a regular guy. There's nothing about the guy that's flashy or eccentric, nothing. And you're just a, you just a regular guy in a situation and just do that. That's harder than doing a character because you don't have any thing like to imagine whatever you're just in it. It, it's very tough. And a, the best example, I one of the best examples of that I ever saw, and it was extraordinary, was Kurt Russell in... Graceland? No. Although Kurt was in the, uh, the movie where his wife gets kidnapped out. I, I'm trying Matt, to think. Madeline Snow, I think, plays his wife. He he's driving along, and she, his wife gets kidnapped by truckers, and he's in this town, and they they want him to go rob a bank and get money to get his wife back. And he's just and he's just playing a regular, average guy. He was so amazing in that movie, and it, and the people that don't that aren't actors and don't study it and really know it, they have no idea how hard that is. Movies. Was that unlawful entry? 
I'm not talking about you and your first date with your wife. I'm looking I'm at Madeline Kurt Stowe Russell. and Kurt Russell. It's called Unlawful Entry. It's not about my wife, uh, who says Just hi, by the way. She said wife. hi, by the way. Did she? Yeah, to you. She told me to tell you hi, and I said, I, that's not a good idea. <laughs> Please don't say hi to John. He'll be outside with a long lens. I don't mean that as a metaphor for your penis because you have a macro what okay i'm not offended if you say i have a small penis i have to commend you i tried to mention it earlier but it's hard because you do you know 20 minute monologues which really helps me i mean i love my answer is shorter no i love everything you say actually this is delightful for me i first thing i love catching up with you go on and on about Montgomery Clift, he said, it's acting is like it's five or six simple little things that you do that add up to a character. So he said, for example, you could be smoking a cigarette. And so you're just having a regular conversation with someone. You're smoking a cigarette and then you forget to flick the ash. All of a sudden the ash is like this long. And then you go, oh, he goes, that tells you something. And the audience is reading into everything you do. So you need to like figure out what to do. But uh, I used to think you wanted to control everything you do. And now I'm like, no, you don't control it. Like, just let it happen, you know. Like right. know everything and then just go off the other person. And, and as long as you do that, you're fine. A big departure for you was a, a part that you did in this Todd Solondz movie, Happiness. And it was a little creepy and it was quite amazing. Your work was really great. What what Thank was you. that? Ex- I, I'm just asking you, what was that for you? I'm and just- what was the re- how were the reactions to it, which everybody told you how great you were in it, I'm sure. Because people were talking about it. It's an upsetting movie. Well, you know, naturally, when everyone's telling you how great you are, my head went like. Very know. large, right. And I, I think I stopped speaking to you for about a year because I thought, wow. I just so wish it had been longer. <laughs> <laughs> Your cat's back. So what was that experience like? First thing, he's a really um, interesting director, right? I met with Todd Sol- Solans, the director. Oh, is it Solans? Yes. I didn't know. I didn't get the phonetics and on so, it. So um, everyone said, what is Todd like? He's a very nice guy and he's very smart. But I said, you know, he's like, if Woody Allen and Penny Marshall had a baby, that's Todd. That's what I described. Anyway, he was very smart. We met about it. And then I didn't hear anything for about five months. So I, and then I got a call saying he wanted me to play that part. And uh, so we did that scene. It was, it was, it was, um, he was great to work with because he wrote the script and he directed it, but he's a very good director in the sense that he would collaborate with you because uh, anyway, whoever works with me, I said, look, I don't just show up and go, what do you want me to do? I go, I have ideas, but I want to collaborate because I know that, you know, with, with my ideas and, and with your ideas, we'll get to, you know, way up there. And so that's what he was like. And so I'd say, well, I think in this and this, he goes, he goes, yes, but also don't forget there's this and this. And I, oh, yeah, right, right. You know what I mean? He, he really knew what he wanted. He was, he was great. Um, and it was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a hard scene to do. Very. Because it was so well written. See, people go like, what's harder to do when something's really well written or poorly written? I go, well written. Because when it's well written, you have to bring yourself up to the level of the material. And it's a real challenge. And when it's not well written, they're going, can you make it funny? Can you add to it? And you're like, come on, man, you do it. See, I disagree. When something's really, really well written, that's when I'm, because I'm always at that high level, always, just by nature. So when something's poorly written, I have to work harder because I have to aim down. I live in a fantasy. Let me talk to your wife. (laughs) So the point is that scene was hard to do because I said, uh, by the way, I said to Todd before I go, I want to, I want to play it. Um, you know, really, really real. I don't want to like do the, my usual, you know, cause, blah, blah, by the way, a lot of movies I get, I go, I want to play it real. And they go, no, no, do that thing you do. Like, Oh, hello. And how are you? And I go, I don't want right. to do that. I want it. But they don't want that. So it's kind of frustrating, but on the other hand, I always feel very, very lucky to get any job. And I never walk through a job ever. <laughs> because as soon as you do that, people go, oh, he lost it. He doesn't have it anymore. People are very, they don't understand how they go. But that's not go why like, you do it. You I give it. It's so you, funny. 
It's like, you know, oh, what do you mean? I'm still funny. Like it went away. Like yeah, I, I know they, the- they do that with me also. But the point is you give a thousand percent to no everything. One says, you- no one says you're still funny. No one. Oh, okay. Where's my thing? I have a thing here. Oh, this is good. You, you're going to want one I've never these. heard anyone say he's still funny. Like you lost it. I never heard anyone say that. Oh, because they never said I was funny in the I'm first place? That. I'm just saying, I never heard anyone say you're still funny. I like it in the kitchen. Kitchen, of course, is code for butt. (laughs) Who are your closest friends? It ain't me, because we haven't talked in a while. Well, that's your decision. It's your decision, too. If I call Dave Coulier, he calls back. I don't think you call Dave Coulier. Can I tell you a funny story? And maybe, well, you, ha- maybe, you haven't maybe, yet, so it would be good. <laughs> well, John Stamos, as you know, is not only an actor, he's a great drummer. Plays with yeah, the Beach Boys. That's so he correct. calls me up one day and says, hey, you want to come over to the house and play music with some guy? I go, yeah, I'd love to. So it was really fun. So then he invited me a second time. And who's there? The, the lead singer of The Knack. Right. Doug Feig. Fe- Fe- Never nice guy. So they start playing My Sharona. That's the song he sang. And so I'm singing. Of course, I'm making up words about you. And then you were laughing, and then you got mad and ran out of the room. I did not. I have only laughed at you. Oh, Bob Saget. He likes it in. Likes it in the bud. Did let house down. (laughs) But you're one of the few people that makes fun of me not out of love. (laughs) That's true. So uh, close people. No, Dana. it's just because it's just because. By the way, I don't make fun of you. I defend you. <laughs> I defend the rumors <laughs> that were started by me. <laughs> it's such. It's like the dumbest joke ever. It's so. Childish. I think your cat stole the keys. Um, you're close with uh, who, someone I love, Dana Carvey, right? We became very close friends. I remember when, when and we were at, um, I didn't know if, you know, Phil I knew from the ground, we were close friends. And then we met Dana at, at the offices of Brilson Grand when they were on Sunset. Yeah. And uh, and we met him and then he left. He was uh, going to be auditioning for Saturday Night Live. And I remember we both said, oh, I hope that guy gets it. He's so nice. He's so nice. And yeah, he became one of my best friends right away. And I remember Dana gets the show and then he, and then we had an office and, and I, I, I got my own office in SNL my second year. So he comes in, sits on my couch, and what do you do? He goes, I'm hitching my wagon to a winner. And I go, why do you go, I'm going to hitch my wagon to a winner. Let's write something. And I remember looking, I'm going, I didn't know. I go, well, I don't know what, you, what do you do? I'd never seen him perform or anything. So you know? super talented. And then, and then we joke, and he goes, and I go, I go, yeah, you hitched your wagon to a winner, and I slung you forward and ahead of me. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Dana, Dana. It is so funny. He made me laugh when so hard I threw up. But that's because you ate too much. That you're getting confused. I had a cold, and he was making me laugh, and I was starting to feel sick. I go, "Stop! I'm going to throw up." And he kept going. One year I, before he got SNL, and before I got Full House, we went to dinner, and we were both musical comedy. We did musical comedy in our stand-up, and it was before he did the audition at Igby's, where he got SNL, where. Uh, Lauren had come to see him. Sorry? I think Lauren brought Cher. Maybe. Cher, yeah. I wasn't on that showcase. I had already lost out four times to getting on it. Franklin and Davis. I didn't know who you were. Yeah, you didn't help me. You never mentioned me, but we didn't really know each other. You want to hear something, though? No, I didn't finish my story. I know it's unusual I'm for you. Sorry, go ahead. No, it's a short story. We would All go right. to dinner, and we said, "Why are we not getting shows? Everybody has shows. Like John Lovitz has a show, and why aren't? Why don't we have anything?" And he didn't then know. six months later, he ended up on SNL, and I ended up on uh, CBS Morning Program, and then Full House. So it, your dog's actually oh, putting man. its butt up to your arm. Your Full dog what? is. Putting its asshole up to your arm. What? Why does your dog know how to do that so quickly? You're twisting it. He's just sitting on a pillow, comfortably next. To That's him. not a pillow. And you're That's turning your... it to a, to a 
It's a bestiality. I right, I don't think it's bestiality. I think it's it's who you've been with for nine months. Oh, he's on a pillow. Ah, shit. Innocent once again. So what were you going to say? And I cut you off after you cut me off. Hmm? Nothing. <laughs> after that Igby's thing, which I wasn't at, but they had auditions at at uh, at NBC in Burbank in a soundstage, and uh, and I was there and Dennis and Nora and they they go yeah we want you guys to be part of you know picking and uh, the thing, and interestingly like Phil Hartman auditioned then you can and you and then they had me go up and join him, and then um but the, that same day Dana Carvey and Jim Carrey auditioned. Now, neither of them were famous at the time. But anyway, they both auditioned. And during both of their auditions, uh, a siren went off in the middle of their auditions because there was somebody on the lot, uh, sadly, threatening to commit suicide and jump from a building. Was it you? Just to no, screw over their audition? <laughs> and... Jim, but they were both great. But Jim was so funny. But I remember thinking, like, what do you think? I go, well, he's great. But I mean, how does he fit into a sketch? It's like a one man show. And I remember I told Jim that years later. And he said, I go, I go, obviously, we were wrong. I go, obviously, we were totally wrong. And he goes, no, 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 you, you weren't wrong. He goes, I, I was like that. He goes, I, it was like, I went, oh, but it's so great. How the hell did you like, make that mistake and pass on Jim Carrey? It was ridiculous. Right. But in Living Color, he w- he did do he did in Living Color he did things that were just him, but he also did some wonderful collaborative stuff. So he would have been amazing. I said it was a mistake. I'm not blaming you. You're not Lauren. I mean, I remember when when um, you're acting like you were in charge of the whole show. Oh no, no, they said no. I said it wasn't up to me, but they asked us our opinion. I remember saying that. I go, well, how does he fit into? But I remember uh, the same thing happened with um, when Lawrence Olivier directed his movie as Hamlet. And years later, he said, I should have cast you, John. I said, yeah. Olivier said that to you. Yes. Okay. Okay, so this is how the liar came about? This kind of thing? This kind of discourse? How did the liar come about? From the lying you've been doing for half of this conversation? No, that was... um, uh, a friend of mine I liked, and she goes, I like a guy with a fat wallet. And I go, well, my dad just had, uh, f- uh, you know, 15 oil wells come in. I go, I am a pathological liar. And then I, I did a thing about it on the growlings, but there was a character in The Thin Man, where a guy going, yeah, that's the ticket and that stuff. And so right. I, I liked old movies like Master Thespian. So I, I go, I want to play that guy. So I would, you know, I would take that, but then twist it into my own thing. So I had the first two lines. She was like, hello, my name is Tommy F- uh, Flanagan. I'm a member of Pathological Liars Anonymous. In fact, I'm, I'm the president of that organization, right? And that's all I had. And then they said to me, then the audience would ask questions. They go, how long have you been lying? So I remember thinking I was going to say, just deny it. I, I go, I don't know what you're talking about. They go, you just said you're a pathological liar. I'm like, I didn't. Yeah, I go, no, I never said that. You know, I thought that would be funny. And this girl uh, in the ground, Robin Schiff, who wrote Romy Michelle's yeah. Movie Robin. They're shooting the ground. And Robin goes, John, you set it up perfect. You just need to stay in character. It'll pay off. I go, what do you mean? She goes, just stay in character. I'll ask you a question. She goes, she goes let's just try it. I go, okay. She goes, what's your favorite sport? And I go, uh, 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 bowling. And it was just funny. I went, oh, geez. I didn't even, thanks to her. I didn't even see it because it was like uh, Jim Dean, who was in the group, uh, Tr- Tracy Newman's husband who tracy was lorraine newman's sister jim would always come up with these great ideas that were comedic ideas that were like really really simple but great so they would just write themselves and you do it all the time constantly i go how do you keep coming up with stuff like that like they're so good and i finally went oh i like accidentally hit on it and then i i got in the main company the groundlings and in in, uh, september of 84 and january 85 they put my life we did a new show my liar character got in it and i did it on uh, we got on the tonight show through Jim McCauley, as you know, booked all the comedians and he booked the groundlings. And I didn't even, it was like a Sunday and an answering machine. No one's going 20 messages from people in the groundlings. Congratulations. Congratulations. 
not saying what for. I don't know what they're talking about. And on Monday, I called Tom Maxwell from North Carolina. He goes, I go, Tom, everyone's calling me to congratulate me. I go, what's going on? He goes, he goes we're going on the Tonight Show. I go, who? He goes, you and the, the Gremlins. When? He goes, he, he goes, yeah, they want you to do your lie character in the truck driving piece with you and Tim Stack and White Man's Rap with Don Woodard and Mindy Sterling and, and Kate Benton. I go, when? He goes, he goes, Thursday. I go, Thursday? Yeah. And we're screaming. We're so excited. Anyway, we Thursday comes. Well, half the time the character worked and half the time they didn't because if they didn't get the first two, the, the, the joke from the first line, which is, you know, a member of Pathological Liars Anonymous, the fact, uh, 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 and the president of that organization. Well, half the time they didn't get it. Like, uh, you know, he's lying about that. So half the time it worked, half the time it didn't. I was worried to death. I go, Tom, what am I going to do? You know, half the time it works, it doesn't. He goes, don't worry, you'll be fine. I go, oh, no. And I only, I had one job, before that, when I was 25, uh, one professional as a, uh, an acting job, the paper chase, the second year, I did two weeks, and then nothing in, in like seven years. Right. So, and then I went to rehearse. I, the director was Quinn, somebody. Uh, anyway, as you know, you go on this night show and you're on the floor. And, and of course, back then, there's only one late night show, it's Johnny Carson. And everyone goes, You get on that, you get a career, right? As a right. career. I remember looking up and it looked like the seats went to the raft, like 350 people. Uh, but it looks huge. You know, the ground was 90 seats. This was like, it looked like it went to the heavens. And I go, and I didn't, I'm looking up like this. So I said, director, where do I look? He goes, just play it right to camera, which was a great advice. So I had something to focus on. Then we go to makeup. It's about 15 minutes before the show. And there is a, Morley Safer from 60 Minutes. Right. And he's interviewing Jack Lemon, who's going to be on the show, right? And uh, and in my head, I'm going, oh, this is that world I've heard about where they all the stars, you know, all of these people and show me <laughs> that I'm in that world. Like, this is that world, that right. magical world, which it really felt like a magical, you know, place to be. No, it did. And uh, Morley Safer says to Jack Lemon, so in your 40 years of acting, what have you learned? And uh, Jack Lemmon said, I've learned to keep it simple. And I thought, oh, that's my answer. Keep it simple. All right. So I know what to do. Keep it simple. Look right to camera. Just go. And anyway, that's what I did. And, uh, and then um, Mike Eisenstadt, who was an agent who, who was trying to sign me, he got to sign me and he just suggested me for SNL, Saturday Night Live, Lawrence back. And I remember going, are you crazy? He goes, no, I'm serious. And I go, Mike, I have a better idea. Why didn't I land on Pluto? Why didn't I do that? He goes, no, I'm serious. I go, will you shut up? You're ridiculous. Because to me, it was an, it was another planet. It was another solar, another world. Where the- I think your chicken's ready. Uh, John. And uh, anyway. John, I- a question for you that I want to, because we've got to wrap it up, because I think you have a life that you want to get back to. It, it doesn't look it, but I know you, you do. We're going from two to five, and it's 343. We've got, I, we've, we've got a whole nother hour and 15 minutes to go. No, I just made it a very long zoom because I know you. <laughs> You're going to edit, edit out all the stuff. No, there's nothing edited out. Even your Jekyll and Hyde five nothing? hour energy drink drinking. <laughs> My question for you it's a is awake from falling asleep, talking to you. Oh, <laughs> Is SNL one of the happiest times of your life when you look back on it? Because people have different ways of looking at it that have been oh, on you, it. Yeah, but I mean, I'm not going to lie. There was times when I, I would call my man, get me off this fucking show. I mean, they would treat you like shit, you know? And Yeah, you wouldn't be in a no, sketch at all one week. and Well, no, it would just be like, you know, first of all, everyone was like incredibly grateful and thrilled to be on it, you know? But every, you were auditioning every week, and then you would be, you would be in a sketch, and then you'd show up for a rehearsal, and I'd go, oh, we cut you. I go, what were you going to tell me? Like, you just, just, there was no, like, um, everyone was just rude. Yeah. There was no, like, you know, uh, this, and then, and then the other guys were competitive, and then, and then if you had a lot of stuff on one show, the next week they wouldn't write for you. And then if you complained, you seemed ungrateful, and it was just, Kevin Nealon said, he goes, every week it's your, why is it? He goes, it's your highest high and your lowest low. It's like every week. Right. Go, yeah, it was just like very uh, stressful. But and you go, God, it's like so 
like just fighting all week. And then the show would start and you go, okay, this is why we do it. And, uh, but yeah, it was, it changed my life. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, you go, well, would you do it again? I go, yeah, in a second. I mean, I didn't want to leave, you know, it, 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 it and, just keep your whole life going. Oh my God. But someone is saying Bob Saget. I know that's, I'm not going to repeat what they just said. Someone really? has my name. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I have a career because of that show. I, I, I didn't want to leave when I left. I, I wanted to do a movie, you know, and I missed two shows and they said I couldn't. And, uh, I said, just come on, I'll, I'll sign for five more years. I mean, I did, I would still be on it now. I, I didn't want to leave. For me, it was perfect. It was, uh, uh, I, I, I liked the variety. I liked playing all these different characters every week. I liked, you know, you this. also I mean, are, the time I was like, oh, I've been doing sketches for eight years and nobody stayed on the show longer than five years at the time. So I didn't know what to do. And, and it was just, you know, I wanted this, and they offered me two more years. I left, and so Lauren, I think, was mad at me because I left. I didn't get fired. I left, you know. But you came back and guest hosted. Well, I would, I'd be in town the next year. I'd be in New York, and, and Al Frank would go, oh, you're here. Can you come and do a sketch? Can you do a sketch? Every week, they'd ask me to do a sketch. And then one time, uh, Brad Gray, our man in calls, goes, oh, John, Lauren said they love you. It's just a joke. I go, what? Well, they're doing something on the show. Don't worry. They love you. It's just a joke. <laughs> I go, didn't, well, didn't you guest host oh, after that? The last show, Dennis Miller's leaving. And Lauren goes, so it's Lauren and Dennis. And Lauren goes, so you're really leaving, Dennis? He goes, yeah. He goes, you're not going to keep coming back like love it, sorry. It's pathetic. <laughs> oh, God. And I was like, I go, they're asking me to come. I don't call them, oh, can I be on the show? They're calling me. And I was really like, what's the joke? And then the audience didn't laugh. And then I found out Rob Schneider wrote it and I confronted him. I go, oh, Rob, you wrote that joke. Oh, we're friends. <laughs> but that's comedians, you know. They're... Yeah. He goes, well, did, I, but I John, you didn't answer. Did, didn't didn't you, did. didn't, after you left, didn't you come back and guest host? I, I recall that. I did in about seven years later. Right. And it was really wonderful. And I, well, but I know I would have done it before, but Lauren, Lauren was just mad at me that I'd left. He was mad at me for a long time. And then we started playing tennis. Out here at the Beverly Hotel, he called me and goes, want to play doubles. And I was I was kind of surprised. I thought he was mad at me. But then anyway, it thawed and, and we get along great. And, you know, I've said to him and I'll say it again. And I'm, you know, he, you know, we all loved him. So it was like your boss and you wanted to please him. It was tough. Right. But I, you know, I've said to him, thank you a million times for giving me the life I dreamed of. I mean, that's what he did, you know. And um, he's he's been, you know. Sadly, my tennis teacher passed away. Alex Almeida was a Wimbledon champion, and I called Lauren. He was very, you know, nice about it. And he's been great to me. And it was, I, I mean, the last time I was at SNL was um, last January. And they, it's pretty funny. They go, they go, right? But they, they, they always do things like, this is how they do this show. It's like stressful. Like they call you on a Friday at 1130. Oh, okay, you're on the show. You go, maybe they want you on a Thursday. All right, let me know. So Friday, right? The show's the next day, 1130. Okay, can you come out? <laughs> they right, wanted, well, what did they what did they want you all right i'll rush so I, I go oh jesus all right well which flight do you want to go well you gotta give me time to get home and pack i mean you know did they want you in a cold opening or was it something later well, yeah, on yeah it was to be uh, um alan dershowitz ah. so i get the sketch it's really funny and but i said yes i go yes 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 so i run i'm on the plane for uh, i'm looking at videos of alan Dersh dershowitz over and over the next day I'm looking at it, my, my rehearsal 345 show up and Steve Jenkins are like, no, no, don't, don't do Alan, just do you. I go, <laughs> I've been studying all this video. So you don't want me to impersonate him at all? Well, you no, should no, have no, asked no, them. Do, Maybe you do. should have asked them before no, you looked at all. Well, I assumed it's, you know, you're playing a character. You assume you could have imitate. watched the Liam Neeson movie on the plane. I was on the show for five years, for Christ's sake. It's like, I go, how do you do the show? Well, how does it work? I know how it works. So I was on it, yeah, fool. <laughs> Nominated for an Emmy twice. I needed to ask, how did that thing work? I know. No, was it the actual Emmy or was it a thing just called the Emmy? Was it EMI? Two nominations. Two nominations equals one win. So anyway, <laughs> I, I <laughs> So I said, well, you mean the jokes like when Gerald Ford, uh, when the Chevy Chase was Gerald Ford, but there was no attempt to imitate him? He goes, yes, we want you. He goes, I'm putting all your little stuff in it. I go, all right. So that's why I started, I go, I'm out and I go, hello, hello. 
and the place went nuts. I go, I'm Alan. Hello. And, and I go, hello, hello. And they all applaud. And then I looked at the other actors. They go, jealous. <laughs> it was funny. Well, see, you, know, you laugh, say that you want no to play a I was like, hello, I'm Alan Dershowitz. You know, there was no, <laughs> and I started laughing because it was so silly. But I remember in rehearsal, Lawrence and I had to look. And they looked at him. We started laughing. And I go, this is so weird. He goes, I know. I go, it's like a time warp. But it was it was so wonderful, really, to be there. It felt like I was at home. Yeah. Really felt like home. It was great. I loved it. And I would do it again the second. Lauren's been great to me. And I just, you know. But when I was on the show, you know, was I like, but I go, I loved it. But at the same time, I hate it. It was like a love hate. It was like, it was very, it was 80 hours a week. You know. Yeah. People, I mean, one time Dana and I got in a fight over it. Over, uh, over, like this little bit. We go, doo doo, and we got in a fight over that. You know, it was like it, it was every little thing. And he was like, by, by, and then we, then he felt horrible. You know, an hour later, I'm so sorry. I go, I'm so sorry. I go, Jesus, it's like, it, you know, it, it, it was intense. There was only eight of us on the show, and it was great. But you're not just acting in the show. You're auditioning every week. You're writing. You're performing. You're, you know, and it's great like that. Right. But it's, 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 it's um. You know, it's 80 hours a week. And then they're, and they were constantly like kind of messing with your head. And, you know, you, you know you're going to have a lot of competition this year and you better do this. And this one said this. And this one's trying to get your sketch off the air. And, you know, I have a set designer going, you know, so and so, they're trying to get your sketch off the air. And when they would pick them, I'm like, what? You know, and, and we were obsessed with the show, the show, the show. I mean, even now, it's like, it's like, uh, I'm like right back to how it was. I'm like, we were obsessed. And when I remember when I hosted, I remember thinking, God, everybody, it's so calm and everyone seems to get along so great and everything. And then I thought, we were funnier. <laughs> well, the first year, the first year of and the I show. And I don't know if you need that tension to be funnier. I don't think you do, though, really. I don't. The first couple of years were people. severely. And people in- that are on it now, wait, I just want to say, people that are on it now, the way they describe it, it's the same. Yeah. Colin Jost has been on there forever. They go, what's it like? He goes, well, you feel like you're auditioning every week. You don't know if you have the job the next year. Yeah. I go, I go, it's the same. Like nothing's changed. The only thing that's changed is you and your goddamn attitude. Towards so Anne. John, we're going to, we're going to wrap it up because, because you have a lot of calls to return. I've been hearing your phone no, ringing. I, got, I think your dog ate your cat. Cause I haven't seen <laughs> Bless. Oh my God, you're a sea manatee. So the question I have for you is what are you looking forward to now that we're coming out of the quarantine? You're going to get the vaccine. Um, So when you get that, what will you be looking forward to as the world opens up again later in this year? Well, I hope that happens, Bob. As you know, they're having a terrible time with distribution of vaccines. I'm aware of that, and but I think you are. I'm, I'm 63, so I'm like in stage uh, four of me or five of getting it. So it's a long ways away. You yeah, know? but you're the liar. So you could probably. Con- and that's still a quarantine. I must Bob, say I, that this is the first. And my dog is also talking. I hear that. But I, I, when I, I get back to normal, I do a game show called Funny You Should Ask with Byron Allen. I'm looking forward to that starting up again. I'm looking forward to uh, doing stand up again. Yes. Also, I got to come up with a lot of uh, new material because a lot of it was about, you know, people, uh, political and running for office, and that's over. Got to come up with new chunks. You need chunks. Um, and I know that you have them every I time. Out a lot of the stuff I did about you might have to bring it back in. Oh, God. Every time you go to the bathroom, don't, you, st- don't you have chunks when you go to the bathroom? Yes. You know what's sad is that's one of the few things I've been able to say during this podcast, and I knew it was going to bomb as I said it. I knew it was not going to work because you, I must say, are the most um, successful you- guest I've ever had. Almost everything that you served up throughout this whole podcast was interesting. It was it was inspiring. You were very open. You explained things about acting and how you love to approach a character. You even told me how all of your characters came about. You talked honestly about SNL. You have a dog and a cat. And and you actually look really good. You look really good. Easy, sailor. Thank you. <laughs> so when well, this... 
why it was a good interview is because I am not an idiot. <laughs> I have a Go. joke for you since we're supposed to be comedians. Go ahead. I didn't make these up. A friend told me. Why didn't Hitler drink? He was a I mean drunk. Because what? Oh, he's a mean drunk. You step on the punchline, you dick. Well, you didn't give Why me a chance to ask. He was a, you're not supposed to answer. You know that. Are you like... Do you, no, oh. I'm supposed to ask. I'm supposed okay, to ask. No, no. Why didn't this, Hitler drink? He was a mean drunk. <laughs> Hitler is making a speech to 100,000 people. He goes, and so we're going to kill all the Jews and five puppies. And everyone's like, why are you going to kill puppies? He goes, you see, no one cares about the Jews. <laughs> now, do you think cancel culture will try to stop a joke like that? I don't know. I just said it. I didn't stop me. There will be people that uh, that defend Hitler that will think that's insulting. <laughs> John? I want to tell you uh, something that I'm I'm not scared to tell you. I love you, John. I love you, and I'm really glad you did this podcast. John. Thank you, Bob. You're welcome. I'm not saying it back. I didn't think you would. It's okay like for me. You like me as a friend? I have a special place for you in my heart. <laughs> is it is it next to that thing that makes you burp? Yes. Ugh. Stay well, John. Stay well and tell your dog and your cat that it's okay that you violate them because the pandemic will be over and you'll stop you putting... Did you cut from this? I'm sorry? You said nothing is going to be cut from this? I, I, I would think something might be, um, you know. No, but most... Oh, that's fine. No, I because I you want to cut the political stuff, but please don't cut this because I'm doing a podcast. And my first question to you, Bob Saget, will be, why do you hate the Jew? <laughs> <laughs> when is and your you, podcast, John? You know, whenever I get my shit together, don't hold your breath. I did one before, you know. It's not the first time. I do know that. I do know that. Do you have food there or are you going to eat one of your animals? What? You can't hear me because of your animals. I think you got to feed them, John. I fed him. He's, bar he's barking at a squirrel. Oh, is a squirrel in the house also? Because it looks like a freaking zoo. John. <laughs> oh, John. That's a beautiful cat. That is a beautiful cat. Uh, John, happy new year. I hope 2021 uh, is a good one for you. John, please don't show that. John, don't show that. That's hey, when you Bob. show that part of your cat, it's redundant. Um, I love you. Take I care of yourself. And thank you for being on here. And I love you, Bob, as a friend. So just, you know, don't get your hopes up. <laughs> But that, I don't have to because you said something nice. John, I'm going to let you sign off because I don't want to hang up on you. And that You've been listening to Bob Saget's podcast. <clears throat> I'm John Lovett. We'll be right back with Bob Saget. <laughs> well, that was, uh, that was uh, my friend John Lovett's, who I do, I do love. How do you not love John Lovett's? Um <laughs> I don't think I talked. And when I did, I had to shout over him. But that's okay because he's hilarious. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, do what you do. You rate. You review. You know. You comment. Um, you subscribe. Or you follow. However you do your podcast. Um, that was John Lovitz. Who will be out and about as soon as we're able to perform and get to work again. Uh, you don't want to miss him. If you have a chance to see him doing stand-up, you want to do that. Um, and I'll call you guys at some point, so there's a phone number up there in the menu thing, whatever it is, and you can leave a message. Take care of yourselves. Um, this is a, uh, a difficult time that we're uh, slowly going to live through and climb out of, and I wish you all the best and, uh, and lots of love, everybody. <laughs>